Hello, everybody. <coughs> we are the Historical Commission of Town, which is not the Historical Society, which is a various thing, separately incorporated, but we're um, part of the town government and we're responsible for historic preservation. One of our responsibilities, we realized, is to kind of monitor the town's record keeping about historic buildings. Um, and particularly to monitor the state record because there is a, a statewide database um, of historic structures. So we've been talking about how to take that on. Um, we've got records on 150 buildings, the town pounds, neighborhoods, lots of different things, and most of them haven't been updated since 1993. Um, and we thought, as a way of getting started, that we might have a couple of meetings with people who are interested in the notion of historic preservation just to see what kinds of things people are interested in and how we might go about um, tackling this kind of big job. But what we're going to do is that Judy Markland is going to take us through most of this, particularly MAPRIS, the state um, inventory. And along the way, Alan's going to talk about how to do deed research, and Darcy's going to talk about find a grave, um, which is actually really great and fun. And either Susan or Fred, her surrogate, will talk about some of the maps that are available. So, Judy, I think we hope this works now. What we wanted to do is help you think about how you can research your house, your neighborhood, um, structures that interest you in town, the milk bottle, the, the pound, the stockade memorial. And so we pulled together a list of things that, that would be helpful. And I should say that there are a lot of Wheatley specific things here, but this works for <coughs> almost any town. My husband looked up the, the house he grew up in in Newton and was had a great time. Didn't you, Bill? <laughs> um, so, so you can, you know, you can look up the house your grandmother lived in in another town or something like that with the same thing. Donna mentioned these inventory forms. The way the state works, the towns provide the detail and someone, I don't know if it was the society or the commission, got a grant to do most of these in 1993. So they're 25 years old and the world has changed, but a heck of a lot of research went into it. We have two national registered districts. In order to get accepted as a national registered district, you have to apply with a very detailed report. Those are available. There are two town histories, one by Crafts that goes through 1899, and then one by Ina Kane that updated it for the bicentennial. Both are available from the Historical Society in hard copy. The Crafts is available online. The Historical Society has a huge collection, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, there are maps, and the maps can tell you all <coughs> sorts of fun things, and they go back to the 18th century and up to the current day. The Registry of Deeds can tell you the history of the house and the <coughs> If you're interested in more recent changes, the town has a lot of records of building permits. You can find out when something was done. When was the addition put on? Or when did they tear down that barn or move that barn? Well, I'm not sure about that. Cemetery research, find a grave, and the Whiteley's own cemetery records. So I'm going to start with the inventory forms. They're available for five different types of things. Areas, uh, these are clusters of buildings. They can be neighborhoods. In Whateley, an awful lot of them are farms. So you get one or more farmhouses and then all the outbuildings. There are individual building forms. So you can look up by address for your own house. There are structures. Could be a bridge, could be the pound. Objects and cemeteries. Now, they are available in print at the Historical Society. They're also available online. They give you all sorts of stuff. Dates, historical information, how neighborhoods were formed, or 
gee, what was this house used for once? Was it a store or a post office? Who lived there and what they were famous for? Also for buildings you get styles, you get uh, changes over time, and obviously the changes of use. Now how do you get to this database? Well, it's called MACRIS, Massachusetts Cultural Resource Inventory System. And all you really have to do is Google MACRIS and you'll see something come up with that heading. Then you pick the town. It lists every town in the Commonwealth. You scroll down to wait list, add to list. If you just hover over where it says village and neighborhood, just put your mouse over it. All the neighborhoods and areas in town will come up. And you could pick it, Waitley Center, or some you've never heard of, like Canterbury. But you don't need to do this, and it might be even more interesting not to. And then when you pick, this, this slide assumes that you're picking an area. And you get a screen that looks like this. And the area forms, the column on the left, WHA stands for Waitley. And all the forms start WHA for Waitley. If it's an area form, it's got a letter after that. As you can see, they could be a farm, they could be something like Waitley Center Historic District. What's interesting is these don't have street numbers or street addresses, and that's because they're clusters of buildings. They may be on multiple streets. They certainly have multiple street numbers. So you can't search for them by street. If you see that blue square to the right, that means there's an inventory form, and it looks like this. If you click on it, <coughs> you can pull up the inventory form in PDF format. And if you see the red button, that means there's a National Register District right up. If you look for the other form types, everything else except an area, it'll be WHA plus a number, not a letter. It will have a street address. It will have a date, and the rest of it is pretty much the same. When you click on inventory, you'll get something that looks like this. We chose the Smike's house next to the post office because the town owns it, and because it's had kind of an interesting history. This was the way it looked in 1993. It was vacant. But that's the cover page for this form. You can see the second page is very different and then there's a lot of detail. It will give the history of the house, it will give the architecture of the house or the structure. It will tell people who live there what neighborhood it's in. This one was a grocery store, a post office, and a single family dwelling house. It's now community housing. It's had a long life. Now, there are other resources that can help you with this. And as you go through, I think if you do read this form, you'll find that most of these were available to the researcher who did the, the inventory forms. But that doesn't mean they can't tell you something additional, something helpful. There's a crafts history of Whateley through 1899. Now, what we call the Smike's House, there is called the Samuel Leisure House, store and house. That was the original builder. If you go to the Crafts history, it's going to tell you, gee, he came here in 1828 and he built his house up there next to so-and-so's house on the east side of Chestnut Plain in 1850. And then it will tell you about his store, and this is a paragraph about merchants in this town. Eurotus Morton kept an assortment of merchandise, including spirits, but William Sanderson and Samuel Lazure just sold dry goods and groceries. No spirits, they were much duller. <laughs> now, the form will tell you that it was a store. Crafts will tell you a little more about what was there and who the competition was and what the village was like. And also, in another page, it turned out that Mr. Lazure was a postmaster. And until his advanced age compelled his resignation and his daughter took over, but he still kept handing out the mail until his memory of faces and names seemed to fade away. 
Now that's not the sort of detail you're going to get in the inventory form, but it helps you get a really good perspective on this guy and what the house was like. The Historical Society has photographs. They have an enormous collection of photographs. The one on the top left is, one, is a photo by the Allen sisters from Deerfield, and that shows when it was a post office in 1888 and that was when Samuel Azur was there. By 1910, you could see the porch has changed. It's got a lot of fancy molding, fancy ladies living there. It's, it's no longer a store, a very different kind of place. And when you read through the form, they'll, they'll talk about the changes in architecture between those two. So she obviously used the photographs to get her architectural research. This is kind of thing, this, the historical society can flesh out for you. They have photographs of the people who live there. Now, if you're an old time, well, not even old time, but a lot of people know Simon Spikes, who was a great character in town. And he was a resident there with his mother. And that gives you about as good a sense of Simon, except he didn't have his hat on sideways. Now, they also have documents at the historical society. And these three, talk about when it was converted to community housing. And there was a national program called Make a Difference Day. The town turned out 73 volunteers to gut the house and did such a good job they convinced the, the housing state housing department to give them money when they hadn't intended to. Um, they have the program for the ribbon cutting for when it became community housing. So you never know what you're going to find, but they could have they could have diplomas for somebody who lived there. They could have receipts from when a, something was a blacksmith shop. They might have the orders for it or something. It's a place to get perspective on a building or, or a way of life, I guess. You want to talk about the maps? I can. Unfortunately, lately, was not as well mapped as more, less rural places, because especially in the 19th century, most of the mapping was done for two reasons. One, to survey, or two, for economic reasons. Uh, meaning this kind of map would be, it was a general town survey from 1830, or you would get individual surveys, usually on a transfer of a piece of property. And those are often attached to deeds at the Franklin County Registry of Deeds. And if you're looking for a particular piece of property, the best thing is to go and do a title search and just go back through all the deeds. And sometimes you'll find a map or a survey of the property attached, which will sometimes give also information on the adjoining properties. So if you're looking for a particular, you know, say the Smite's house, you'd also want to look at the properties on either side and then back and do searches on them because sometimes there will be information about the adjoining properties. Uh, sometimes the maps like this will give you information about the areas. This has, it's got old street names, it's got old neighborhood names from 1830. It does not have, if I remember correctly, house names. But it, do, it does show you where the houses were generally. Probably the, the two best sources, 19th century sources, for identifying a house with an owner are two maps. One is the 1858 Walling map, the big five by five foot map of Franklin County, of which there is a little map of Waitley, and Waitley is also shown on the main map, and both identify the owners of the houses in different ways. So those are great for trying to figure out who owned that particular house, in this case, 1858. In general, at least as far as the owners go, the maps, these maps are relatively accurate because they were trying to sell these to people in town. And if they had your name misspelled or if it was in the wrong place, the likelihood was they weren't going to sell a copy of the map to you. So they had canvassers and who went through the town and did a surveyed the roads and found out what all the shops were in town and who lived in what house. And 
generally they did a pretty good job of keeping it accurate. Now, you can see here that they're not exactly accurate in the way they depict this going off at an angle, which it doesn't really. But you can also see that the road here widens out, which is quite accurate. That the town hall was really almost right on top of the road, and in the 1871 atlas, which I have a copy of the original here, they're also, you've probably all seen that map of the town as well. This map of Waitley, which you've probably seen either in original or reproduction, the Historical Society has a copy. And there's a map of the whole town, there's a map, a little plan of Waitley Center, and on a different page there are little maps of East Waitley and West Waitley. With Waitley spelled wrong, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, and, and so as far as I know, these are, the 1871 is the last printed map that shows the, the landowners on it. There's another one that is hand drawn. That's why I said printed map. You, you're very. <laughs> uh, which was, you know, the history. It's a recollection of someone. Recollection who, of Charles Waite, who was my great grandfather, but. He sat down at age 96 or something and drew a diagram of where everybody in Wheatley lived in 1880 and included it in his memoirs. And anyway, we're, we're yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I can talk very briefly about these. But I do want to mention something about the maps and macros itself. Um, a lot of these six things are incomplete. You won't find everything that you want to look for. Macros in particular is censored to some extent. There is almost no information on prehistoric sites, and there's not information on anything that's archaeological. There are a bunch of mill sites, for example, on the, uh, the Westbrook that are, are going to be removed from the National Register uh, District records because they, uh, they're subsurface remains and they are subject to looting. So the Mass Historic Commission hides these things and does not produce them. And there are a lot of other things that might be missing. You, you do have to remember that these are 25 year old documents that we have. They're source of macros here. And they are not as complete as we would like them to be. We found errors in them. And they will um, eventually get corrected. It's going to take some time. Um, the deeds registry. I was actually kind of surprised to discover it's not immediately obvious looking at it that you can actually go back to the very beginning of at least European time, back to 1663 is when the, the records first start. Uh, you can, if you Google Franklin County Registry or Franklin County Deeds, you'll come to this website which is Mass Land Records. And that's where all of the <coughs> deeds now have been recorded. I'm not sure that's the case for every county in Massachusetts, but I think virtually all of them are available and Franklin County is one of them. You can go up and search for these on your own if you want to go up to the county courthouse up in Greenfield, which is now newly refinished. And all the old books are there that they uh, copied these things from. So once you find Mastland records, you can search by a number of ways, by the name, the book that it's recorded in, what the property name was, the date that it was recorded. You're going to have to learn a lot of new jargon uh, to deal with these old books. Grantor, the one who sold the land, the grantee, the person the land was sold to, there are warranty deeds, and quick claim deeds, mortgage deeds, uh, all sorts of things, many of which refer to the same property. Um, but you'll eventually convert into what it is that you want to look for. I found when you have to look at these things, they do provide a tutorial, which is available on the uh, Mass Land, Land Records homepage. And so you can follow from a great many ways of, <coughs> of looking at these things. It does help to look at the surrounding properties. You'll find there's a lot of recycled verbiage that occurs in the, the land records, the same descriptions of the land appear for sometimes 100 years or more. Um, and you'll, but you will find different butters who are listed. So you find people who used to own the land next to the land you're a part of. So the land starts as one large lump that is granted to a fairly small number of people. And then it gets reduced to smaller and smaller things. And they sometimes grow or shrink even more as, as time goes on. The deeds records you would think would be absolutely accurate, but they're not always. 
and there are mistakes in them, and you need to be aware of it and to look for them as you as you work your way through this. This is one of the reasons that often helps to go up to the main office where the records are actually stored, because they have librarians there, people who can actually help you sort out what all of this stuff means and, and what all the different kinds of deeds there are that exist. They also don't necessarily have everything. I believe a lot of the records that went through um, probate and the like are not stored in the, the land records. I believe that they're stored If I can, elsewhere. a lot of, yeah. if a property went through probate rather than through sale, it won't show up in the registry of deeds. Right. It'll be in the probate. It'll, It'll be, be in the probate, probate office. We didn't go there, so. Yeah, that's, I'm not sure. What, they may get added. I'm not sure if those are online or not, but uh, they are available mm -hmm. at the uh, Franklin County at the land record office. I just wanted to add, if you click on Smikes, for, say for the deed one, you get another window that I didn't show here that will tell you, give you an option to look at, I think, image or? or There's an image or view. Yeah, view or image. You can actually see see the document itself. Yeah, you see the original. They try very hard to record everything. may not be able to read everything. it, but you can see it. No, it's, it is readable. It, it's, your mileage is going to vary when you try to print these things because I found that it depends a lot on your browser uh, if, you, if you go online. Sometimes they print easily, sometimes it takes four or five tries to actually get something that's printable. So you can do it eventually with almost everything, with Chrome or Firefox or any of the other web browsers that you like to use in these cases. But that will, I think, do it at the moment. Okay. Me. Uh, find a grave is so when you're on the macros listings it does list the the cemeteries but it doesn't give a whole lot about the cemeteries kind of gives when they were formed and it's like the oldest stone there and that's pretty much it <laughs> on, on the macros listings but find a grave is this online resource that is kind of group sourced where people go around and take pictures and they take down the inscriptions on the stones and write all that information onto the site and someone did our cemeteries and so virtually all the stones are on there except the most recent ones. And the way Find a Grave works is you go to findagrave.com um, which you can Google. There's also a link on the Historical Society's site and there's a link at my blog at Waitley Cemeteries. When you go to that site, you can search for a cemetery or you can search by name, someone's last name, or if you know the, their whole name, you type it in. Um, and as much information as you know, the closer you're gonna get to finding where this person is, where their stone is. Um, so if you, for instance, Sam, Samuel Plazier, I put in uh, his name, and I put in like born after 1800 because I didn't have the exacts of all of him. But then I also put Waitley, Franklin County, Massachusetts, and it came up with his stone. And what this site does, it, if you have a smartphone, it's really awesome because it'll GPS it for you. So you can, it'll get you to the cemetery and then when you're in the cemetery, it gets you somewhat close to the stone so you're not searching forever for it. Um, this also has a lot of other Things, other like features to this site where you can you can sponsor a memorial so that it doesn't have ads on the page. You can also be a photo taker if you sign up. Um, so if someone's some family member from way out on the west coast is requesting a photo of the of the stone, you can be a person to take this photo for them to send it to them if they're looking for something different about it. Um, and then you can also be someone who, who goes about and finds places that, that are stones that haven't been added and add them in. Uh, you can also, it has this kind of social media aspect to it, which I don't really use, but you can add flowers to a <laughs> memorial. So if you're not near someone, you can add a flower online to their site. But it's actually a really great source for finding uh, uh, stones within our cemeteries if you're trying to find something. It will also give you the other names on the stone. Yeah, it, it gives you everything. So it gives you their, the other names on the stone. It also, if the person's really good, which this person was, they will list like the, the stones nearby. So they, they can kind of give you a sense of the, the family within the area. So it gives you some connections of who's buried right nearby them as well. And then as far as our resources in the town, we do have maps uh, 
that give you, I, they're kind of hard to follow, but I can use the maps to get us somewhere. Um, and then we also have old records of, you know, from things purchased, you know, back in the 1800s up to, you know, our burials and plot sales and all that now. But it's pretty limited what we have in terms of records. So, some towns have uh, better records than others. I'm not sure what Big Big has. And in my early days, I took a lot of pictures of the uh, the Hadley Cemetery, the old cemetery in the center of town. And it mattered actually by taking pictures relatively early because a lot of the stones were made of sandstone, the yep. earlier ones, and they erode very quickly. So you don't get much of a name on it anymore. Right. Things yeah. are just worn down to end up now. Yeah. It used to be fairly intact. Well, and that's why a, a lot of these, there's also like, uh, there's white another marbles. one. Yeah, there's another, there's another site, a big billion graves or something like that, but that's a lot of the reason some of these were popped up, is to try to get some sort of group sourced record mm -hmm. keeping. Uh, and there is someone, I'm forgetting his name now, but there was someone who was recording, he was gone through and taken photographs of a lot of our stones in the town of Whateley. Uh, and he's writing a book on Probably the Bob Drinkwater. Bob Drinkwater, yes, he's writing a book on the um, uh, the stone carvers in the area. Yeah. And we have a particular stone carver who did a lot of the stones in Waverly, and so he's going through and taking a lot of photographs. Yeah. So he's a good resource as well. You could have photography too. Yeah. Or yeah. I, I bump into him a lot when we're in the cemeteries together. I think Donna found that. If she was researching something, it helped to check the surrounding town cemeteries. Not everybody was buried in Whateley. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to check dates, and I yeah. couldn't figure out where some, for some reason, our house turned over very frequently. And so there were a lot of names on the list, and so I started searching Hatfield and Deerfield and Sunderland, yep. and I found a couple of them, which was great. <laughs> you know, well, and a lot of times know. when I get phone calls of people asking about a family member from people will call from about family lineage prior to when we were even established and I end up sending them to Hatfield because that's where a lot of the information is but yeah you have to check around the towns nearby. I think we've covered a lot of this. <laughs> we have some great resources, some people did a lot of great research, nobody's perfect. Um, I can give you an example. The post office was built by Harvey Waite. The inventory form says Henry. Um, may, I give, may I give my example from sure, behind you? Sure. I was reading all the stuff that's in the 1993 uh, inventory form for our house. And you know the way you read something a couple times and then you really read it? <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute. If this woman got married when she was 45 years old in 1830, and she then had 10 children, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it turned out it's wrong in crafts. And no, sorry, it's right in crafts. And whoever set up the um, the entry just transcribed a number. No. Um, <coughs> it's, it's so, type of, so that's the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. When we get to it, we're going to start correcting. Now, the other thing is names can change. There's weight spelled with E's without E's. Um, I had a great aunt who inherited the name Root with R-O-O-T and added an E to it because she thought Root was too dirt sounding. <laughs> she wanted a classier name. And she, she was known as, you know, so these things change. Um, you can have two people with the same name, different generations, or cousins. Um, it's very easy to confuse them. And we've talked about the roads. Um, and you mentioned the street renumbering. When 911 came in, all of the numbers in town were changed. So, so um, you could be looking for an old deed or an old probate, and it could well have a different number and be the same number. Yeah, there are a lot of details of things that have changed or things that are wrong in some of the original records. But it also means that there's an awful lot of original research that people can do that's a larger scale than the, the details that we have here. Um, there's plenty of original work that can be done. Um, 
all the property that we have in town and the places and uh, the names of things and all the rest of it that may not have been done yet but needs to be done. As I said at the beginning, um, we started out with the notion that we would bring up to date the 150 plus entries in Macris and um, having spent two or three hours fighting with just ours for our house, I realized and I hadn't quite finished um, that it's a lot of work. But I, I think we would really encourage any, any of you who have an entry to look at it. Uh, most of the things we just talked about, the things that are online, are pretty, I, I worked my way through them. You know, when you go, you go back and forth and back and forth and you think, oh, it must be this button. They're pretty intuitive. Um, so I think play around with it and um, let us know if you're interested in bringing your record up to date we'd like to help. Um, and then, as Judy said, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, which does not have a, a big staff, will also be happy to help. Um, they would like things funneled through this Historical Commission, you know, because they're not IBM. There's about three of them who work on this for the whole state. Um, but the fellow who runs this part of the program was very helpful in responding to me and help me understand that, remember that you wrote us, Morton, who was on Judy's? Um, well, there, there were two of them, and one of them owned our house for a while, but the dates are all confused, and, and Peter Stott at MHC was really, really helpful. Um, if you would like any, uh, any of the resources, including Judy's PowerPoint, um, electronically, you can either send an, an email to the um, to the email address that's at the very back on page five, or just write it down on a sheet that I collect in the back. I'll send you everything because, especially for the links, it's ridiculous to type them. Just send you a word document. 